Regarding Men, Episode 11, Fearless Girl. Okay, well, hello everyone. Here we are again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as Paul is wont to say. I'm Janice Fiumingo, and I'm here with Paul Elam and Tom Golden, and we are talking today about um, women on corporate boards and issues surrounding women's demand for full representation or gender equal representation in various high profile positions and the various accommodations that have to be made for women, uh, according to our uh, feminist overlords. And so we're going to sort of start to, to sort of set up this discussion. We're going to start by uh, talking a bit about the fearless girl and uh, Paul did a great video about fearless girl last week. And uh, as most of you know, Fearless Girl is a uh, small, about five feet high, I think, um, uh, bronze sculpture. And she is meant to symbolize, I guess, women's potential. Uh, she was commissioned by the State Street Global Advisors, and this is a global investment uh, strategy firm. So she was commissioned by them uh, to advertise for some sort of index fund. Uh, with, uh, uh, you know, gender diverse companies where women are in leadership positions. So, so that's what she represents. But she was set up, as, as Paul pointed out, oddly enough, uh, in the financial district of New York, looking squarely and defiantly at um, the um, uh, charging bull sculpture, uh, also a bronze sculpture that was uh, created by a guy named Arturo de Modica. And Demotica protested, saying that the placement of Fearless Girl right in front, you know, staring down this bull uh, in some kind of defiant, faux defiant manner, totally changed the meaning of his sculpture. Obviously, the bull, the charging bull, represents, uh, you know, a robust stock market. It represents economic progress and all of the good things that that uh, make America such a prosperous place. Uh, and But you know, having this little girl standing defiantly in front of the bull made some kind of weird statement about how the bull was some kind of male threat or whatever. And, and so eventually, Fearless Girl was, was moved, and now she stands, where is she now? She's in front of the um, stock, stock market, market. The, the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. So again, she's kind of, in some weird kind of way, uh, expressing defiance at all the um, anarchic and degrading energies of male capitalism, even though this is all about getting women on corporate boards and presumably capitalism is a big part of why corporate boards are a thing at all. Uh, so there's all sorts of weird contradictory messages that seem to be bound up in Fearless Girl. Paul has a great video in which he, he talks about some of this. And uh, so this is our jumping off point. What does it mean that we are hearing so much lately about how we need to have women on corporate boards. Women, corporate boards are better, supposedly more profitable, uh, make better decisions, um, you know, make wiser investment choices if they have women and minorities as, as well on them. And, uh, you know, so a whole bunch of um, corporate boards are being, a whole bunch of, of companies are being pressured to, to make their, their boards more gender diverse. So this is what we want to start, start talking about. So. Yeah, and there's all kinds of angles to this one, Janice. There's all kinds of angles. And one of the things that has struck me when I first did a search on this, I searched for Fearless Girl, and the first thing that popped up was Amazon merchandise for a fearless girl. It was like, what? It was This stuff is every place. You know, magazines, newspapers, social media, posters, paintings, bedspreads, greeting cards, t-shirts, necklaces, books, clothes, everything's got fearless girl all over it. And what's the message? What's the message they're trying to portray? Women are fearless. But now wait a minute. Who do we see running into burning buildings to save the children? Who do we see jumping into frozen waters to save someone else's pet? You know, who, who, do we no see fall, who do we see falling on grenades, you know, to protect their, the people around them? I mean, my goodness, this is crazy. And what it is in my mind is the artificial inflation of females. You know, 
Women are not fearless. Come on. To me, that's just an affront. They're not. You know, they, they're, and we're artificially inflating them, pumping them up with this idea of being, I mean, if you look at the stuff on Amazon, it's like there's t-shirts that say, be fearless, you know, fearless this and fearless that. Come on, be a woman, be who you are. Mm, you know, yeah. and that's, that's fine to be and who you are. And if that happens to be a whiz in the financial district, that's yeah. just fine. Exactly, and that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Nobody's arguing that, but what they've done, and what feminism always does, and it just makes me want to pull my hair out. Yes. These work environments in the financial district, in foundries where statues are made, in all kinds of work environments, yeah, they involve some level of good-spirited, I think, competition, often between men, for succeeding and, and, and becoming an asset to their organization. And feminists has, has viewed this whole scenario as we're going to bully our way into the workplace Yes. And we're going to start by creating a divide. Mm-hmm. The exact opposite of what needs to happen for success. Because cooperative work is, that is, you don't build pyramids. You don't, you know, achieve moon landings and stuff like that. Unless you have a lot of people working very closely together toward a common objective. Yes. The feminist model is... No, we're going to bully our way in here. You people are bad, pointing at everybody else in the workplace as women come in and say, now here, we're going to move the furniture around to suit us and what you think doesn't matter because you're bad. So true. How is that supposed to work for success? What recipe is that for other than failure? Yes. And as, as Tom, as you were talking about earlier, that seems to be, what is happening is that we yes. have forced women onto boards, their productivity and their profitability is decreasing, not increasing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's the typical feminist Mobius strip. You know, you only see one side all the time. You just see one side. And whether it's this or domestic violence or whatever, I mean, it's just amazing to me. And you're right, Paul, if you only see one side, you're never going to get cooperation. If you inflate one side and deflate the other side, you're never going to get productivity. You're going to get a mess. And that's just what we've got is a huge mess. It's crazy. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, and you know, the thing about fearless girl as a symbol, and supposedly she is a symbol of courage, of bravado, of women's potential, of how women have been, you know, supposedly held back for all of human history, but are now finally coming forward. But what a bizarre choice, and I'm pretty sure you alluded to this, Paul, in your video. What a a bizarre choice to choose a young girl. She's a prepudescent little, I don't know, are are we supposed to know what her age is? Is she nine years old or eight or maybe ten? I can't really tell. No, but she's fearless. That's all you need to know. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and, And yet, yeah, there she is, you know, standing like that. And I just thought, how bizarre. And, and, uh, does it, actually uh does it signify some kind of deeper truth about women as a class that they are so darned excited to rally around this little tiny girl who has to be of course protected and everything has to be changed to make it a safe environment where she can Mm -hmm. succeed and where she doesn't need you know she doesn't need to fear anything and it made me think that, yeah, of course, I, you know, I agree, obviously, that there are many women who are highly competent, competitive, incredibly smart, you know, bold, determined, self-motivated, all those things, and <laughs> more power to them. But um, the idea that the symbol of women's progress is this little tiny girl, I think it actually does Uh, give evidence of an underlying truth, which is that women as a political class are just out of the infant stage. They expect that everything will be done for them, not that they will adapt to environments or adjust their work habits or their attitudes or anything else. They think that other people should do things for them. I mean, this is the thing we complain about over and over again and it's symbolized for me in that that little girl that this is exactly how women see themselves 
as not fully yeah. agents, even though they're constantly complaining about how they're not given full agency. But you're never given full agency. You take full agency. You don't squawk and wait for somebody else, usually a man or a group of men, to do things for you and to make the context perfect for you to succeed. You do what is necessary so that you will succeed. And this is something that feminists, and I have to say women in general, when it comes to women's behavior and responses in the workplace at large, it's something that women just can't seem to get their heads around. And so we see constantly now all sorts of articles still, you know, 20, 30 years after feminism began to demand, you know, women's full participation in the public sphere, you're still seeing constant articles about how various workplaces or various academic departments or indeed, you know, large corporations need to change so that women can feel comfortable in them. And it's just amazing. I just recently was reading an article about how the, the depart physics departments, how the whole discipline of physics, which is one of the very few disciplines in academia that, that you know, doesn't, isn't yet dominated by women, uh, you know, and how it has to get rid of what this writer said was a, what he called a Herculean model of the individual achiever working really hard, leading by example, you know, working overtime, knocking himself obsessed with a particular problem, and that this was supposed, supposedly a stereotypical idea of success in physics, and it needed to change so that women could flourish. I've read so many articles. I have a friend who, uh, this is something bothers him, he's always sending me articles about this, from um, uh, magazines related to uh, law. Uh, and how, how legal firms are going to have to change in order to attract and retain female lawyers because supposedly law firms need to be gender diverse as well. And what this ends up meaning, every single article that you read, what it ends up meaning is that women shouldn't have to work as hard as men. They shouldn't have to come in on weekends because that's hard for them. They shouldn't have to you know, knock themselves out to get a certain number of billable hours every month in the way that men do, because that's hard for them. They shouldn't have to spend boring hours and hours away from their families making contacts, making relationships with clients, you know, at the golf course or at a, a sports game or whatever. They don't want to have to do that. But that's how law firms work. And, and there's no, I, no understanding that law firms are successful when they <laughs> please their clients. And clients want lawyers who are available to them. You don't want to get an answering machine message saying, I'm with my family because I have, I have work-life balance. And that's a good thing. And so I won't be able to get back to you for another three or four days. You know, that just doesn't work that way. And there seems to be no understanding on the part of most, women's, uh, most women that they have to change themselves and that they're not little girls that can demand and whine and have everything changed for them. But that's the thing, Janice, is that they are. And you, I don't think it's any accident that Fearless Girl projected all these neotenic features, mm -hmm. that, that there, there's nothing accidental. Those things are designed, neotenies by design, triggers the parental brain particularly in men. And so they're not saying we want into the workplace or we want into the financial area or, or whatever that their, you know, their demand du jour is for entry. They're not saying we want you to recognize our competence and recognize our work ethic and recognize that, that we understand that the corner office and quality of life are usually mutually exclusive that they don't, they don't come together. Men get this all the time. They don't even, nobody has to tell a guy that you're gonna sacrifice if you want that corner office and right. you're gonna sacrifice everything right. if you want that corner office. It's just taken for granted. But they are coming in as children wanting parents to say, oh, you know, it's only fair that Susie gets a corner office too. Uh, you know, Johnny has a corner office, so now he has a corner office for Susie. And, you know, she can do the work later. And, and that's really what's going on here. So true. 
underneath all the garbage and all the pretense and women can do anything men can do. And, and, and I'm fine with that. Man, if you can prove that, go for it. I'm happy for you. Absolutely. Uh, there's no issue with that. But what they're really saying is we're children. Please pamper us. Please put a cushion under our butt. Don't make us work too many hours because uh, that interferes with our quality of life. And how will I have time for my kittens if, if I have to work too much? And I mean, and they say this stuff with a straight face. Yep. It, yep. It's absolutely amazing. So, you know, I love, I love Fearless Girl. And what I think you need to understand, you know, I remember one of the comments I got to the, to the video talk I did on this was that somebody needed to build a brass statue or a bronze statue of a Rottweiler taking a leak on Fearless Girl's leg. <laughs> and, and here's what I want to say about that. You know, a lot of people might look at that, and matter of fact, they did. A couple of people on the Facebook uh, on Facebook commented, what a terribly hateful thing to say. Well, guess what? When men are being honest about guys that have gone in, to say, to the financial district and sacrificed everything, maybe lost touch with their children, with their wives, with everything that's important to them so they can succeed and take care of people, and then somebody comes in and says, I'm a girl, give me. That is how they feel. That's exactly how they feel. And they have good reason to feel that way. Huh. It's not misogyny. It's not hatefulness. It's an honest, righteous indignation with this absolute quackery of let me in because I'm a child. Yeah. The double standards. Absolutely blows Great. my mind. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Hmm. Yeah, and this is the thing that's really, um, I mean, it seems if you wanted to set up a system whereby you would produce resentment in high achievers and um, hyper, uh, hyper claims, hysterical claims of victimhood in um, lesser achievers, you couldn't do anything better than a system that goes on for decades, um, you know, putting people who have not got there as a result exclusively of merit, putting people into all sorts of positions that they didn't earn, uh, and, and then making it that you're not allowed to talk about it. I remember when I um, was first hired at the University of Saskatchewan in the late 1990s, um, affirmative action hiring of mm -hmm. women other designated groups had already been going on for many, many years. And, um, and I, you know, I was shocked by how overt it was. It's all hidden. There's all this plausible deniability around, you know, it, it's, it's said that it's hiring that is to remove barriers. Well, everybody's in favor of removing barriers, of course. Uh, so we're supposed to make sure that, you know, the job is advertised widely and we're supposed to make sure that there are no biases against women or physical minorities or what have you. Nobody has a problem with that, of course. Um, but what it really means is that as soon as there's a candidate who looks at all likely, who fills one of the you know, boxes, allows the ticking of a particular box, that's the person who's going to be hired, whether they're the best or not. And, and one of the things that um, there was a document produced about how we could make you know, even greater strides in equity hiring. And one of the things that was mentioned was that after a person is hired under the equity hiring program, Everyone should be careful to go around and say how wonderful it was this person has been hired and no one should ever mention that they were hired under the equity program. So not only do high achievers have to watch less achieving, lower achieving people who don't necessarily have all the qualifications or aren't necessarily the best be hired, but they can't even mention that that's what has just happened. And so obviously the, the resentment that people feel is completely natural. And the, on the other side, it seems to me that the person who is hired and realizes either in the moment or afterwards that they were hired not on the basis of merit, but because they fit some particular category, you know, especially for women, since this is primarily targeted women over the past 25, 30 years. Um, I mean, what it produces in many women, I would think, is therefore a need to affirm that indeed they have, you know, struggled with all these various barriers. And so from that point on, from the point of being hired on, 
they are going to look for all sorts of reasons to claim their victimhood. And so you just, you actually make the situation worse. You're going to have a situation where you have people in places where they don't really fit. They may pick up vibes, even from very well-intentioned colleagues, they may pick up vibes of resentment or condescension from those people who know why they were hired. And instead of recognizing that, and it's a very uncomfortable position to be in for everybody, instead of recognizing it, they have to create an even larger victim narrative. And it's just a recipe for you know, incredible conflict and bad feeling and, and know, complaints and absenteeism and stress and all sorts of disastrous things. And you get items like, I love this little gem, uh, I'm a woman, so I have to work twice as hard as men do in order to get the same recognition. Yeah. Um, I find that it's just insane. Uh, yeah. I have a, a secret pleasure. I love uh, cooking shows. And when they bring these professional chefs on there, one after another, uh, every almost every woman that comes on those programs says, uh, I, it's a man's, it's a male dominated field. So I have to work twice as hard as anybody else. Well, guess what, Cupcake? Every man that goes into the workplace has the feeling in his head that he's got to work harder than everybody else. And he that, does. That comes. That, <laughs> that's right. That's a natural part of being in the workplace is that you've got to try to have a good competition to outperform your coworkers so that you're the one that ascends. Um, and they turn this into a victim narrative when it's, you know, something, it's just the way things are. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it, it's the opposite. And, you know, in, in, in well, I don't know about in <laughs> professional chefs, but certainly in, in many places that are trying to fulfill these gender diverse mandates, it isn't true that the woman has to work twice as hard. She has to work less hard because, you know, all sorts of doors are going to open for her merely because she's a woman. Yes. And, you know, to pretend that that isn't true is just bad faith. Yeah. And there's a lot of men, of course, that will enable that, uh, particularly with attractive women. Uh, they will absolutely bend over backwards, go out of their way to make sure that she doesn't have to work as hard or that she gets promoted ahead of her term, mm -hmm. um, sometimes in exchange for sex. I mean, let's face it, that's what goes on in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sitting here uh, I mean, I don't like the attitude that I see in a lot of women coming into the workplace, but I see where the enabling comes from, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Men, men create their own monsters. Yes. And I think our culture has created a monster here, too. You know, with the, with the press pushing the idea, you know, that women are fearless or women are this or women are that. And... You know, you can see it very clearly with this particular thing, with the uh, because the Forbes magazine did an article upon on this whole idea of whether there is um, increase in income for companies when you have more women on the board, because the Washington Post, the New York Times, everybody and their grandmother has been saying, "Oh, put women on the board, your company's more successful." They've said it so many times now that people think that is true. It's not. It's not true. It came from a company called Catalyst back in 2004 who, who came to the conclusion that, well, companies will make 66% more if they just put more women on the board and they'll have their CEOs will have higher pay and this and that and the other. And they just, I think they just kind of made it up. They, they did some quasi research, but really it wasn't real research until it came along. And this Forbes article talks about this real research that comes along and says, well, actually, when you look at it from a research standpoint, no, companies don't make more money if they have more women on the boards. In fact, there are some cases where it looks like they make less money if women are on the board. Tom, unsound research regarding women? Say it ain't so. It's the same thing, man. It's the same thing. Everybody should go. Listen to what Forbes said. However, we have to stop stretching the truth in order to promote women's opportunities in organizations. We must not fabricate results about the benefits of hiring women. That's Forbes magazine. Mm -hmm. They're speaking the truth. Now, how much did the Washington Post pick that up? Mm -hmm. You know, no one, they, they all want to believe this myth. You know, you put more women on the boards and everything's going to get better. 
Well, it's, it's crazy. It's, well, it is crazy. I mean, because like obviously, if you put like a super super smart, high achieving woman on a board, probably going to do pretty yes, well. exactly. <laughs> but like just this idea that women themselves, because they're women, are going That's to right. somehow improve the function of these boards is is ludicrous. You Makes know, you no sense. Somebody, yeah, you could just see somebody, get me a woman on this here board. I know our, <laughs> our, our uh, productivity is going to go up by 30% just by having the woman there. Get me that woman. Any woman, grab her off the street. I mean, it's just, you know. Bring in more vaginas. <laughs> yeah, we want yeah. more money. I mean, even if they're, <laughs> uh, uh, it's just crazy. Yeah, a friend of mine sent me all these studies. Um, like meta-analysis, so studies of studies, you know, of this whole thing, uh, you know, whether corporate boards are, are better when they're, when they're uh, gender equal or, or whether uh, companies do better with a woman at the head, you know, all these different things. And, and there just, there just is no evidence. And, right. and as he pointed out to me, even if you could find, uh, you know, that here are, here are a bunch of companies that have women on the board and here are some that don't and they're not doing as well. It, that in itself wouldn't prove anything right? because you'd have to have a control study. Yes. And, you know, and, and we don't have that, you know, and he pointed out to me, you know, just really obvious things about like, maybe, maybe women choose more successful companies to work for. Yes. Or maybe the more successful companies are covering their asses by hiring a couple of women because they know this is the, wave of the future or whatever like there's all sorts of variables so that even yes. if you could find some kind of evidence it wouldn't necessarily allow you to conclude and why would it that just the presence of women would it you know would improve uh, functioning so and it's so bizarre because the very people that tell us that you can't judge according to stereotypes that men and women are essentially the same you know all those kinds of things are also the ones who will say that women have all these qualities and that the very presence of women you know has a as a net benefit for, for yeah. companies so a total is it totally crazy and yet you know you see it all the time in these yes. states yeah well I tell them this... that down in florida what was it i know this is anecdotal so oh go ahead much into it, but down in florida couple of years back they the Sweetwater awarded, Bridge. The Sweetwater Bridge they awarded it to a company because they were all female, all female engineers, and the fucking bridge collapsed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did yeah. they claim it was all women who yeah, did it? And, and you know something? That media wise, that bridge collapse, which was a big deal, yeah. was swept right under the rug. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was like, oh, my God, look, squirrel. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the Forbes article did a, a real service in looking at this whole idea of causality because, you know, what some people are saying is more women on the board, more money. But they said, you know, guess what? The more ice cream that's eaten, the more murders we have. I thought, oh, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. But he said the two are completely disconnected because – what happens is when it's hotter, people eat more ice cream and there's more murders. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the yeah. same kind of reasoning is going on with the uh, with this women on board stuff. You know, it's like you've got another variable that's not even seen there that's actually driving both things. I, I find that often to be the case when you hear people. Here's a great example of that: the the misconception that marijuana is a gateway drug. Alcohol and tobacco are the gateway drugs. Those are the first mood-altering substances that people enjoy. But because of an agenda about law enforcement and, and there's a lot of money to be made in the war on drugs, they promoted the narrative that it was actually the, the next drug, which for most people is marijuana after alcohol and tobacco. Uh, but it is tobacco and alcohol that are the gateway drugs. Hmm. And, People talk about marijuana as though it's a gateway drug when in reality they're already past the gateway. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But that's how easy it is to manipulate research. Yes. Yeah. And to make claims. No. And and boy, they they, you know, <laughs> it's like I swear to God, if I were a woman in modern culture, I would be losing my mind yes. at the childlike pampering. Mm -hmm. that the world assumed that I expected. I know. And it's like, I, it, only somebody that's blind to the fact that they've lost their dignity can enjoy 
and appreciate that kind of enabling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's also enabling that's dependent upon speaking poorly of the people you love. You know, it's like, what? Yo, good. I'm, I'm pumped up, but now this guy's an asshole. It's his fault. It's like that. There's something wrong with that crap. And you know, the whole scumbag uh, element is is involved here too. The State Street Company that did the whole thing that that hired the the um, artist to make the thing and do this and do that. Someone looked into their voting record, and they found something really interesting. When there were when gender issues were involved, they voted no eight out of ten times. Hmm. <laughs> so, you know, they're saying what they're, what they're doing is they're getting free uh, publicity with this stunt. And now they're pissed off because guess what? The artist who under contract could only make one version of, of the statue. Now it's making more. Someone said that they're, they're, she's getting $250,000 per statue, but her contract says she can't do that. But now there's one popped up in London. There's one that popped up in Norway. There's one that Melbourne. popped up in Australia. Yeah. So she's making a killing. They're all scumbags. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Meanwhile, I want to, <laughs> as I am often want to do, I want to remind everybody how underrepresented women are in coal mines and semi trucks. And yeah. sewage yeah. workers and trash men. And combat fields. Yes. Uh, oh, but they want to be there, Paul. Oh yeah, I know. Uh, so what, how about if we proposed special programs in junior high and high school designed to direct women toward coal mines? Yes, yes. Yeah. What, and that's lobby. not a good idea? Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Service yeah. work. Yeah, until those are all equaled out. And I was Let's thinking about- have no more discussion about getting women into these high profile positions. I was thinking about that the other day. Go ahead, Janice. I interrupted. Yeah. Well, it, no, just you know that you know, that point that it really is nonsense. It's nothing to do with gender equality. It's nothing yeah. to do with women wanting to take the same responsibilities in the public sphere. Yeah. It's about women wanting those very high achieving positions out of a sense of of resentment that our culture has encouraged and uh, entitlement. And entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. That's my, that's one of my hashtags that I always keep trying to get get trending. Yes, it's, it's, uh, feminine entitlement uh, or entitled femininity. That's the, that's the one I use, and it, it simply is. I mean, it's it's yes. utter nonsense. And and uh, you know, just go back to what you were saying, Paul, about the Sweetwater Bridge. I have a feeling we'll never know. I remember right before the bridge collapsed, a woman came forward saying she'd brought her daughter to see the construction and she was so pleased because, you know, she was intimately involved and they were doing construction differently because women can deny, can design bridges and they can do them and, you know, do it in fancy ways. Then the thing collapsed and all of a sudden, you know, it, it all, yeah, it all went away. And we'll never know now who was actually involved, who was to blame. We're told that there wow. were these obvious design flaws and all of that sort of thing. Was it because there were women or indeed certain uh, underemployed um, minorities that were hired by that firm? I mean, it, all, that, that's what the rumor was. And I'd like to know because when bridges start falling down, that's really where the rubber hits the road. And and I we I used to joke with a friend about that you know we'd say well surely that all this affirmative action all this promote women stuff it has to stop somewhere or you really do have planes falling from the sky and bridges collapsing and people dying but it seems like maybe even that isn't enough to get people to take an honest look at our you know manic desire certainly not our media won't do no. it our media will not cover this if in any way. They think it may damage the women. narrative of the women's movement, um, and we don't even we don't even know whether that bridge fell because of incompetent engineering. I mean, that would seem to be a superficial suspicion. At any case, <laughs> because of the, the fact that it fell, you know, without having you know a bomb drop on it or something like that, but we don't know why, and we're not going to find out why. Because the media has no curiosity whatsoever wow. about what went on with that bridge. 
It's crazy. I never saw a news story so important disappear so quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gynocentrism runs silent and it runs deep. Yes, yeah. it does. It really does. It's amazing. I mean, I. It is amazing. I, I once thought that it would be only in the fields where you could never really tell, you know, what, you know, <laughs> like, think, like my field, English literature. You know, if it dies, that's too bad because it means that <laughs> the love of literature and the teaching of it and everything are, are, are being lost to the world. But, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to point a finger and say, you know, this is as a result of not valuing real expertise and real ability. But now I really wonder. I think you know we're we're willing to go much much further than I ever thought we were in, in, in this direction. That we would prefer virtue, or virtue signaling anyway, to nearly anything else. We prefer it even to productivity, even to safety, even to high performance. Well, look at the encroachment of things like women's studies and that all the narrative that comes with it into the hard sciences. Yeah. I mean, they're now really calling math misogynistic. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah um, absolutely. I mean, and to think that this isn't going to have a profound impact on every sphere of in- achievement and endeavor and research and discovery and invention in, in North America, it, it is. And, and yet we seem willing to pay the price, at least initially. I, I just, somebody sent me something just today, this morning that the um, Australia Defense Forces have now introduced gender-based analysis into military analysis. And that means that, um, and they give us an example, if there's a bridge, an enemy bridge, that they're considering blowing up, that they have to take into account whether this means that women will have to walk further in order to do their shopping and therefore will, you know, I mean, it, like it, it I, I thought maybe it was a joke and I haven't checked it out yet, but I don't think it is because the person who sent it to me is a very serious person. So that even in the military, you know, so, so, so that countries are willing to lose wars in order to care more about enemy women than about their own national security or or. Or, or interests. It's and of course, you know, when Australia does send troops somewhere, which they have done in the Middle East in recent years and a couple of other places, they send them in and they, 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 they do what needs to be done. But it, the rest of, they turn the rest of their whole military into a social experiment. And that can only happen in a country that is reasonably certain it will never yeah. really have to defend itself. Right. Uh, <laughs> because if you really think you might have to defend yourself, you're not going to see China doing this or the Russians oh. uh, or America, for that matter, these days. Um, but we still have some of this same fantasy land uh, that, oh, women are now combat ready. But still 97 percent of the people that die are men. But we, we, we have to act like, and I can tell you somebody that was in the military, when they ended the, the WACs, the Women's Army Corps, and integrated women into the services, if I would have said anything about it, and we used to do maneuvers, and, and we would have to pull up tent pegs and go across a lot of terrain and re- reestablish camp, the women re- went and sat under the trees while all the work was going on. And if you said anything, you could end up court-martialed. What? Are you serious? Serious, very serious. Did they, did they give them bonbons? No, they just made sure that they were in shade. And then when all the tents were set up, most of the low-ranking enlisted men still had to sleep outside. Most of the big tents and everything were reserved for command personnel and women. <laughs> oh, God. So I had to set up their tent for them. They went in and to, to sleep in the tent, and I got to sleep outside. Okay, I uh, I, and, you know, I was in the service, so I, I figured roughing it's part of the deal, right? <laughs> but he didn't. So th- that's okay. But, I, but then if you made noise about this happening, you were subject to first an Article 15 punishment, which is non-judicial. They reduce your rank, take your money, and combine you. To your company area, or you could end up being court-martialed. 
God. So you better not complain. You better be a fearless girl. Yeah. That's how fearless these girls were. <laughs> they were being protected from my, my dissatisfaction. <laughs> Kind of system run, run silent and runs deep, man. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy, and no one sees it. Yeah, no. No one sees it. Yeah, and most of the guys around me at that time, and I guess I was always somewhat red pill because I noticed it and said, what is this bullshit? Yeah. And most of the guys around me were like, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah, just do your job, man. Where's the girls? Job. Let the girls inside. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Runs deep and silent, man. It's crazy. People don't yeah. even see it. So are we about finished? Uh, oh, my God. You know something? We just keep forgetting to talk about the puta and the humanitarian. Oh, the puta. I forgot all about it. We've got to call another another uh, huddle here. <laughs> yeah, let's call well, another huddle. we got to, we got to do it on the job. Well, we could certainly give our humanitarian award to Arturo Demotica, who insisted that his charging bull sculpture yes. was not face down fearless girl and yes. i think our flying puta deserves to go to uh the woman Kurt, Kristen visball i think is her name Kristen visball yes she yeah. was the creator who, of fearless uh, girl and who is now the creator of many fearless girls in breach of her contract <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, and you can buy a 22-inch version also for six thousand oh, dollars. I'm sure you can. I'm I'm sure There's, you can. They're going to make a thousand of them for six thousand dollars each. 22-inch version. Wow, it's money, it's boy. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe she's betting on the fact that she can make more money selling them than State Street advisors can get out of her in a lawsuit. Exactly, and she's probably right. She probably is. You go, girl. <laughs> So the flying puta goes to Kristen Bisbal. Indeed. She'll be flying through in no time. Oh, oh there she goes. Oh, there it is. Hold on, Kristen. Man. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> While we're here. Yeah. PMI 19, Chicago, Illinois, in August. What is it? 16th, 17th, and 18th. Mm-hmm. Well, all three of us will be there with flying mm-hmm. colors along with many other people yeah. who deal with these issues. So you've got Karen Strong, you've got Bettina Arndt, uh, you've got uh, Steven Svoboda, which I can never say his name right. But Mike the, Buchanan. Uh, Mike, Mike be there. Buchanan would be there. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hobson. Elizabeth Hobson. Yeah. Yeah. An emerging great voice on men's issues. Yes. So a really good job. Yeah. And a lot of other people. Um, I have seen it on the announcement page that Count Dankula will be there, um, which I think is going to be uh, quite interesting and a great new addition to a men's issues conference. Uh, but we will be there for three days, enjoying the talks, enjoying a few drinks, and each other's company. And as always at an ICMI, you do have a blast. Link to tickets below. Get it while you can, folks. I think this one will sell out. Nicest people you could meet anywhere. It at will ICMI definitely my conferences. Yes, yeah. It will, it will definitely sell out because there's more to be announced that's coming up, right, Paul? Oh yes, there's more. Buy your tickets now. Buy them Get now. now. <laughs> oh man, trust there's me. A lot buy more them now. To be yeah. Be yeah. Amen. So we're good. Yes. All right. And it, you'll see Tom and I quite soon too in another episode of You Can't Make This Shit Up. And you can't make it up, man. We got some stuff, up. man. We got oh. some stuff. <laughs> Y'all take care. All let's right. See, let's All see right. if I can turn Bye-bye. the Bye-bye. thing off, Paul. You think I can? Why don't you turn the thing I off? Don't. Oh, yeah, here we go.